afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on what part of the world you are at, and happy International Women's Day, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Chatham House, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here today for our special International Women's Day event, Climate Action and Gender Equality. Can we close one gap without the other? We're delighted that we're organizing this event in collaboration with the UK Presidency for COP26, their team, and uh, delighted to be welcoming Minister Anmin Marie Trevelyan. Now, what about this event and why we're doing it today? Well, it's not a new topic. Uh, we've been discussing for over 10 years, 13 years, in fact, since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change first identified the ways in which men and women are differentially affected by climate change and then specifically by natural disasters. And indeed that panel already then found that women were disproportionately uh, taking on burdens related to climate change and climate adaptation. So what have we done in the years since then? Well, that's going to be the topic of today's discussion. This is a great event uh, opportunity ahead of COP26 to explore how gender equality and climate action go hand in hand. We've brought together a fantastic panel of women, climate feminists, activists, experts, and, and advocates to explore and to discuss what is being done, highlight cutting edge work that is taking place around the world and suggest where we might need to focus our efforts going forward. Now, this great panel I'm going to start with, just quickly run through the names, and then we will offer you a chance to listen to them, but also then if you to engage in any questions, comments that you may wish to put to the team as we go forward. Um, this event is on the record and it is being live streamed, so you'll have an opportunity to follow it later and to share. Now, very briefly, let me just introduce the panel today. We have uh, in first, of course, in our opening remarks by Minister Anne-Marie Trevelyan, UK international champion on adaptation and resilience for the COP26 presidency and Minister for, of State for Business, Energy and Clean Growth. We have Verani, Verania Chow, Programme Specialist, Gender Climate Change with UNDP, the UN Development Programme in New York. From the UK Environment Agency, we have Emma Howard Boyd, who's also been appointed UK Commissioner for the, to the Global Commission on Adaptation. From Amsterdam, we have Zora Moussa, Chief Executive of Mama Cash, the oldest international women's fund in the world, which is providing small grants and non-financial support to grassroots social justice and human rights groups led by women. From Nigeria, we have Olaretsu Adenike, who goes by uh, Adenike, an eco-feminist and climate justice activist who is ambassador for Earth Uprising and African Youth Climate Hub. And from Nepal, Sonika Mandanda, a UN young champion of the earth, who's also a National Geographic Society 2020 emerging explorer. And last but certainly not least, Alicia Herbert, Gender Envoy and Director of Education, Gender and Equality in the UK's Far Enough Commonwealth and Development Office. So it's a wonderful team and I really want to welcome all of you today and say how much we're looking forward to you joining our conversation. I'm going to start though by first uh, opening the floor to Minister Trevelyan to offer us some opening remarks on why the question of gender equality is so central to effective action on climate. Act, on climate. Uh, Minister Trevelyan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Renata, for that kind introduction to our esteemed panelists and to you, our audience, for joining our important discussion today on gender equality and climate change. As the COP26 Adaptation and Resilience Champion, I have met with some amazing female activists, advocates and leaders to hear their views and ideas about how we can ensure that gender is at the centre of our efforts to adapt and build resilience. This is essential because historically marginalized groups are indisputably and primarily as a result of wider discrimination, sociocultural barriers and inequality more vulnerable to those climate impacts. 
This includes, but is not limited to those living in poverty, people with disabilities, youth, indigenous peoples, and of course, women and girls. Women and children are significantly more likely than men to die during climate related disasters, and they comprise up to 80% of those displaced by natural disasters. Women constitute more of the world's poor and are often directly dependent on threatened environmental resources as their primary source of food and income. Women often don't have the same access to other resources, such as education, information, land and credit, that would help them to respond to a changing climate. And climate change also worsens existing inequalities, increasing gender-based violence and the exploitation of women and girls, particularly for the most marginalised. Around 12 million more young girls are thought to have been married off as the frequency of natural disasters has increased. It also impacts girls' education, as after natural disasters, girls are often the first to drop out of school to help their families. It could be easy, in light of this incontrovertible evidence, to paint a picture of women and girls as mere victims of climate change. However, we know, and the panellists here today can attest to the fact, that women and girls, as educators, decision makers and advocates at all levels, are critical in the fight against the climate crisis. When we take action to confront climate change in our communities, in our countries and organisations, we should, of course, be mindful of the ways in which climate change affects men and women differently. And we should work to actively promote gender equality and to empower women and girls. Their insights and experiences are invaluable if we are to find the right solutions. We must therefore do all we can to amplify their voices. This will not only improve gender equality, but it will also lead to more sustainable, better outcomes to the climate and our societies. 140 million years of productivity are lost annually because of the hours that women and girls spend using slower, more polluting cooking methods. Just try and get your heads around that statistic. By investing in clean cooking solutions, emissions will be reduced and girls will have more time to pursue education. There is also evidence of better outcomes when women are brought into adaptation and resilience action. Lower death rates, following on from hurricanes in Central America, for example, have been ascribed to women's involvement in the preparedness education. So through our presidency of COP26, we will deliver on the gender action plan agreed by all countries at the last COP. For us, this means committing to integrating gender equality and inclusion into climate action and enabling women, girls and marginalised peoples to be a critical part of the fight. And I see this as an essential part of my role. I am committed to ensuring that our adaptation action is gender responsive. Without actively addressing the unequal power dynamics that drive vulnerability, including gender inequality, adaptation efforts risk failing to reach their core objectives or even further exacerbating marginalization and climate vulnerability. So the UK has also supported women's empowerment and leadership within our clean energy sector, investing in women's skills and setting specific targets for diversity and gender equality. Prioritizing gender equality in our mitigation work will help us deliver net zero by 2050. And we know that education of girls goes hand in hand with their empowerment. So we have set an ambitious global target to get 40 million more girls into school. Ensuring 12 years of quality education for girls will support girls, their families and their communities to be more resilient in the face of those climate shocks. And we also see gender as a key part of our work on climate finance. And we've worked to fund efforts to integrate gender and social inclusion into climate change planning and budgeting processes. Because climate finance can only be effective if it gets to the people who need it most. All of this is why I've convened this group of experts and advocates here today. We look forward to learning from your experiences integrating gender equality for better climate outcomes. We want to know what challenges you faced and how you overcame them. Our panelists have led inspirational work in this area, both internationally and here in the UK. Whether that's through a project working to embed gender into international climate programming or by ensuring climate finance reaches grassroots communities. Let's learn from them today and resolve to apply their lessons to our own work. After all, now is the time to close the gap on both gender equality and climate action. Thank you, Renata. 
Thank you, Minister Trevelyan. And uh, I think particular thanks to you for the specific and concrete nature of some of the, the details, the examples you showed, uh, the astonishing statistics about the scale of potential when women use and have access to things like clean cooking materials. So I think this is really critical. And I'm sure there'll be some interest in the campaigns for COP26 that you've outlined, including in finance. But if we can hold questions and comments uh, for now so that we can move uh, on to our panel. And I'm going to launch the discussion by bringing you in, if I can, Verania. And thanks for joining us today from New York. So I'd like to ask you first about these intersections between gender and climate action in policymaking. What are some of these intersections and, and how can we encourage policymakers to mainstream gender and climate responsive actions in, in, in their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions? Thank you, uh, Renata. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Let me first thank the COP26 presidency and the Chatham House for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here today. Um, well, I think that uh, uh, the, the minister already alluded to the fact that climate change is not gender neutral and exclusion and inequality rooted in socially constructed power structures and practices play a large role in shaping gender relations and determining who is most impacted by climate change. And even more, for instance, if we uh, um, look at the intersections of gender uh, and other forms of identity, then the risk is being, uh, of being left behind is greater. And particularly under a context of a changing climate and natural uh, resources, uh, disasters and the, the loss of natural resources. Um, and next slide, please. Um, so even if climate change threatens livelihoods and security across the board, we need to be very conscious that women tend to be disproportionately affected due to this unequal socioeconomic status and the lack of rights, so over land or assets and lack of resources. So let me then point three key intersections in this regard. So first of all, climate action provides an opportunity to unlock economic and social benefits if well-planned. Particularly the nationally determined contributions NDC process offers a unique opportunity for integrating gender responsive measures at scale. So the NDC sectors may eventually cover the whole economy rather than just isolated policies and projects. And this gives us a different perspective. Second, women play a critical role in key climate sectors. 79% of the economically active women in developing countries are engaged in agriculture. And women in Africa are responsible for managing 90% of all household water and fuel wood needs. And it is estimated also that women make over 80% of purchasing decisions in OEDC uh, countries. So considering women's agency and not only look at women as a vulnerable group is a much needed approach in policy formulation. This is really crucial. And my third point is a business as usual model will likely reinforce existing inequalities and limit opportunities to close the gender gap. So we need to ensure a just transition from a gender lens. Responding to climate change will unquestionably phase out some carbon intensive value chains. And this is our target. We want greener value chains. However, not all women may automatically be part of high tech value chains. And unless programs are deliberately provide incentives and capacity development is specifically targeted towards uh, uh, women. Now, regarding your second question on how we can encourage policymakers to mainstream gender in NDCs. Next slide, please. A previous analysis conducted by UNDP regarding the first round of NDCs showed that gender inequality was largely overlooked in climate solutions. And in this round, for example, 40% of NDCs submitted addressed gender issues. Now, countries indicated that they had experienced challenges, such as, for, for example, the lack of coordination between ministries of environment and national gender institutions, which is emerging and the lack of not readily available gender information. So we need to recognize that there are persistent challenges at the national level in this area of, of work. And some of these are structural and some of these are operational and we need to provide support to address these. Now, we are seeing an increased interest during the second round of NDCs and this is something very positive. Next slide, please. So under the UNDP Climate Promise Initiative to support the NDC revision process, 97% of all countries 
that are participating in the program have integrated gender equality and social inclusion as part of their work. So, and we have focused our work to support on three entry uh, uh, points that are mutually reinforcing, effective governance, inclusive planning, and integrated policy frameworks. So looking from uh, you know, coordination between different institutions to conducting general analysis, particularly at the sectoral level, and also looking at finance and investment plans, but also looking at the need of leveraging and better articulating policy instruments. So there is a clear path to build the blocks needed to integrate gender systematically in NDCs. Next slide, please. So we are. So what are the preliminary uh, results that we are seeing? This is important. So 26 enhanced NDCs have been submitted from the climate promise countries as of January 2021. 24 have included gender dimensions to varying degrees. And this is important to say because we need to highlight the fact that this will be an indicator for future work required, required at national level. 12 countries whose first NDCs did not include gender considerations now have submitted revised NDCs. And this is also a positive sign. Next slide and final slide, please. So advancing gender responsive climate action that addresses the root causes of gender inequality is crucial in the areas we see countries expanding focus on, for example, such as green recovery or long-term strategies. So the time, and I do agree with all of you, is to act is now, to challenge stereotypes, to remove structural barriers. So to accelerate implementation, raise ambition, and mobilize societies towards achieving the Paris Agreement, gender inequalities need to be addressed. So women can participate equally with men in building climate solutions and can have equal rights and access to economic and development benefits. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm happy to answer any question. Thank, Thank you. you, Verania. That's great. And we'll keep moving along. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions I already see in the chat. Emma, I'm going to turn to you now as chair of the UK Environment Agency. Why is the tackling of gender inequality so crucial for climate adaptation. Rani gave some of the answers, but what's the UK Environment Agency doing in this area? Well, thank you, Renata. And again, brilliant to be here today with the other panelists and Minister Trevelyan. Coronavirus and its many lockdowns has led to women around the world doing more domestic chores and family care. Employment and education opportunities for women are being lost. Similarly, the impacts of climate change, such as floods, heat waves or wildfires, disproportionately hit women's lives. But as Dr. Tamsin Edwards, a climate scientist at King's College London and co-presenter of the BBC's 39 Ways to Save the Planet has said, the story to tell here is not just the suffering of women. We have an unprecedented chance to design a better future. We know that policies that reduce climate change or its impacts can reduce gender inequality and vice versa, as long as they are truly designed in consultation with women. Over 25 years working in financial services in the UK, I've seen individuals and business respond to changes in society at different speeds. Gender diversity leads to better outcomes. For instance, oil companies with higher female representation at board level are more likely to have set decarbonisation strategies. This doesn't mean having more women leads to lower emissions, but it does point to a positive correlation between gender diversity and improving climate governance. Over a decade ago, I helped set up the 30% Club and its investor group to increase the number of women in the boardroom. While we celebrate success in this with a dramatic jump in the UK in the last five years, women's progress to top executive roles is still fragile and slow. Melinda Gates and David Mulpas recently wrote, when the 2008 recession hit, few asked how stimulus measures would affect women compared with men. That approach won't work for the COVID-19 crisis as leaders face the enormous challenge of rebuilding post-pandemic economies, women must be at the center of their strategies. At the Environment Agency, I'm keen that we walk the walk ourselves. Through our flood work and regulation, we help make the country more resilient to climate shocks. In January, I was in Greater Manchester as part of the response to Storm Christoph, where our defences stopped tens of thousands of people from being flooded out of their homes. 
10 of our 15 area directors across the country are women, and so are two of our five executive directors. They lead this response on the ground. Our board has five men and seven women. Among other things, we review our pay gap for disability, race, religion and belief, sexual orientation, as well as gender. I'm not pretending we've got diversity sorted. We're a long way from it, but more inclusive decision-making that is representative of communities we work in leads right. to better I think outcomes. we temporarily lost Emma there. You're back, Emma. We lost you for a moment. Right. So um, representative of communities we work in leads to better outcomes for environment and communities. People with relevant experiences need to be included in decision making. This makes for better policy. So we must amplify the voices of women who work on the climate change and nature recovery agendas, not just on International Women's Day, but every day. WaterAid, a charity many colleagues at the Environment Agency support, says access to water, sanitation and hygiene is already gendered and being made worse by climate change. It is women and girls who are the most affected by water scarcity as a result of climate change, but it is women and girls who lead on the solutions. And when climate disaster hit, it is women that lead the response. So this year, when the UK hosts COP26 in Glasgow and the Convention on Biological Diversity, COP15, takes place in Kunming, China, governments should be discussing greater investment in locally led adaptation. The climate crisis will bring a multitude of overlapping impacts. Men and women will need to use all of our expertise and strength to be prosperous and resilient. Female leadership in international, national and local climate policy making is vital. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emma. And thank you for underscoring not just the importance of local responses and women's role in local, national and international crisis response, but also the value added of bringing women into broader governance uh, and public policy processes, uh, as you highlighted. I'm going to move now to Amsterdam and to Zora Moussa, Chief Executive of Mama Cash. Uh, Zora, Mama Cash is one of the leading organizations in the Global Alliance for Green and Gender Action. Can you tell us more about that alliance and how you're trying to unite women's rights with the environmental justice uh, agenda? Sure, yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for the invitation. Um, so the Global Alliance for Green and Gender Action, we affectionately call GAGA for short. So when I say Gaga, and if anyone knows Lady Gaga, we would love to get a hook up there, um, is it started as an experiment and has now become a practice. So it's um, going on in its sixth year. It was created by uh, a partnership between three organizations, one of which was Mama Cash. The others were Both Ends, which is an international environmental NGO, also based in the Netherlands, but that works globally. And the third, the lead organization, the one that actually acts as, a, as the main anchor point for us, is the Central American Women's Fund, which is a, a women's fund like Mama Cash, so a, a grant-making foundation, a uh, feminist grant-making foundation, but based in Nicaragua, that uh, has a focus on Central America. So it was a collaboration between the three of us to try something new, which was to bring together folks working on women's rights and folks working on environmental justice uh, and climate action to see um, we, we knew all, all of these things that we're hearing, right? It makes a difference. Women are differently impacted. Women are leaders of change, all these sorts of things. So what would it look like if in practice we brought together more or intentionally these two working communities? And specifically, we were focused on um, financing. So how what difference does it make if you intentionally finance looking at these two agendas together? And if you have a focus on the local, on very, very, we might say, have said grassroots in the past, now we use local, there are other terms community-based that we might use, but that's the general principle. Um, and there are maybe three things that you need to know about Gaga. One is that it's a diverse network. So it's a collection, not just of these three organizations, but actually a wide variety of kinds of organizations. There are about 400 community-based organizations involved in it. There are about 40 
uh, NGOs um, that are tend to be more national or regional or internationally working. And there are 20 what we call funds. There are environmental justice funds or women's funds like uh, the Central American Women's Fund or Mama Cash or environmental justice funds that do similar. And our specialty is small grants mechanisms. So making um, grants to groups that are at um, sort of smaller amounts but that are usually coupled with what we call accompaniment, so non-financial support as well. That's the network. The second thing you need to know is that we operate at multiple levels, from the very local right up to the global. So local, national, regional, sub-regional, international, multinational, global, all of it. It's focused on women and the communities they're working with at local level. Um, but the actual network of people involved works at all of those. And we have a kind of intentional effort to look at what's happening locally. What's, what are we learning that's very context specific and deeply rooted in what's happening for people on the ground? And then what does that mean for policy influencing we're doing at these other levels? The third thing you need to know is that there is a focus on mitigation and adaptation, but we are all also interested in looking at the structural and the root causes of the climate crisis and the things that women are facing. And that specific, specifically, we're looking at climate finance and how can that help or harm what's happening. And so we have a focus on looking at governments, investors, and donors within Gaga. Through it all, we're strengthening the voices, the leadership, and the resilience of women who are directly confronting climate crisis. Three lessons maybe I can share about our experience doing this now for going on six years. So this is our sixth year of doing this. The first is bigger is not better. So we've really come to appreciate the importance of being very context specific um, and locally rooted and paying attention to how large scale efforts uh, can be very undermining to actually the thing we're trying to do. It exacerbates conflict, it puts pits communities against each other, at least increases the violence against women, um, and it doesn't actually solve the thing that we're trying to solve. Um, so bigger isn't always better, and sometimes going smaller but deeper is, is the more sound approach. The second thing is that following leadership, women's leadership actually does make a difference. So being able to do this now for five years meant we've been able to build up a track record and build up an evidence base of the difference it makes qualitatively and experientially. And then of course, quantitatively as we aggregate it because we're able to do that because we're such a, a large global program. Uh, what difference it makes if you actually focus on women's leadership and you're specifically working with organizations led by women. So women's rights organizations and their work on environmental justice and climate action. So not just working with environmental organizations that have a gender program or uh, a specific focus on working with women but actually women led organizations. The third one I would say is that indeed money does matter. Of course, it matters where the money is going, right? Um, and this, this becomes important when you're trying to reach community-based organizations. Because we have a focus on working with these funds, these women's funds and these environmental justice funds, which are more embedded and locally rooted, they usually come up from the communities themselves and they're channeling the funding and support. It makes a difference to how organizations receiving the funding can actually use the money. And when we're looking at the bigger climate financing arrangements like the Adaptation Fund, the Climate Investment Funds, Global Environmental Facility, the Green Climate Fund, they have a lot of talk, policies, gender action plans, and very little expertise actually on gender. And so it really matters how that funding is reaching and what we're trying to do with that funding in the end. Not a lot of time to share a lot about what's happening, so I look forward to the, the Q&A to share more. Thanks, Sarah. And, and I think it's really important, the points you're raising, that bigger is not always better in the space of environmental justice and women's rights and the importance and the criticality of women's leadership, as, as you pointed out. So I hope we can come back to some of those points in the discussion. That sounds really great. Adenike, I'm going to turn to you now in, in Nigeria. And you've been very involved in the Fridays for Future movement in Nigeria and many of the eco-activism in, in your part of the world. So maybe just turning to you, where does youth activism fit into the global conversation on climate justice and feminism? And what are the contributions that a movement that you've been involved in, like I Lead Climate and the work you've done around the Lake Chad region, 
what can that do and how can that have impact in, in a country like Nigeria? What's been your experience? Okay, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Um, I am an eco-feminist because of the fact that um, women bear the largest burden of climate change crisis, despite the fact that they contribute the smallest footprint on it. And we have to look inward in intercepting all of these issues that we are doing, because there's always a place of youth activism towards national uh, development and every other development. And youth activism have to be interceptional, of which it has to connect the dots between equality and climate change towards meeting our sustainable development goals and agenda 2030. These are all issues that are interconnected to the global goals that we are trying to um, attain to in the nearest um, decade, which is this decade. And it is important to know that um, in the Lake Chad region, two thirds of those people displaced from their livelihoods are women, due to the fact that women depend on 60 to 80% of livelihood generation on natural resources. And these natural resources are shrinking on a daily basis, the, looking at the land, um, water, and all of these things disappropriately affect them due to the fact that we don't have more women um, decision makers in our House of Representatives, Senate, parliamentaries, government, and all. Because from statistics, it shows that 22% per, uh, of heads of state are women, and 119 countries are yet to meet up to that expectations. And we have to do more because the statistics is not encouraging at all that we have more than a century to meet up towards gender equality. It shows that we need to start um, um, looking forward to um, renewable sources of energy because we in taking water for their household and it shouldn't be so because when we have all of this economic empowerment we could channel all of this energy to produce something substantial something that we can that that could be productive rather than us spending hours in generating all of these resources and also we need to leverage on digital form of um technology because the COVID-19 have shown that we need this digital technology and women have to be um, particular of all of these things. We have to see increase in number of it because during this pandemic, there was increase in violence against women. And studies have shown that um, it, um, climate change increased violence against women. And we are seeing it is visible. And that is why I've been advocating for the restoration of Lake Chad, because the, the loss of livelihoods is a powerful weapon against peace and security. And the elite climate movement is born out of this to see how we can find equality, peace and security. We can intercept these things to see how we can deal with the defining issue of our time. And so far, so good. We have been bringing our activism and we have been recognized by UNICEF Nigeria. We, we have gone to these communities to show our resilience. We have gone to these schools to see how we can educate them through the um, world's largest lesson. We have also made videos to see how we can get people to be educated in all of these ways. Because I can tell you that in a country like my Nigeria, climate change can lead to ethno-religious war because we have different ethnicity, different religion. And when there is this farmer ethnic clash is due to the fight for natural resources, land, because they have things in common, they have land, water, um, climate and these things intercept with each other. So it makes them to have clashes enough. And we have to educate these people because I schooled in the food basket of the nation where all of these clashes are happening. We are seeing that it's affecting food security and women are the great contributors to food security and the population is increasing. So if we don't include women in solving this solution, then how do we um, achieve gender equality? So the elite climate is trying to see how we can make education um, everywhere, especially in Nigeria, where we are seeing these clashes between farmers and elder men. We are, we should see it from the point of climate change, not um, ethnic, religion, or political points, because these are things we need to educate the people to be part of the curriculum, because it's not part of our curriculum. So it's it's a crisis. It's 
it's a problem and it can lead to war. So we have to keep um, alighting this issue. We have to keep advocating it. And that is the point of it, that if we must solve the defining issue of our time, zero hunger, um, zero poverty, sustainable work, strong institution, peace and security, then we must include women. We must involve them to be part of these decision makers. And I want to urge that in this COP26, we have to see more women making decisions because it, statistics have shown that 67% of those that make climate-related decisions are uh, male. So we have to see more women stepping up power. It starts with negotiation process, then it moves around, it expands, and it, it, it's something that can influence other people because I'm not too young to make decisions for the next generation because it all starts now. The youth of today should, should start from today. We, we should not just be seen as the leaders of tomorrow alone. We should also be seen as the leaders presently, and we should be engaged with what is going to happen with the future. So we have been doing a whole lot of work here in Nigeria advocating for the restoration of Lake Chad that have shrunk by 90% because we know that those displaced are women due to the fact that um, the larger percent of their livelihoods depends on this. So it's leading to transitional sex, it's leading to um, forced marriage because in the Sahel region it has been known that 20, uh, 20 million of um, the girls uh, are illegally wedded because we know it's in um yes thank you i'm going to ask you if you may adenika to wrap up just so that we can come back to your questions i think and the really fascinating but also deeply concerning point you raise about the link between climate uh, change and conflict uh, that you're from your part of the world, which is so tangible in the Lake Chad Basin, the implications for women and the need to reimagine and redesign and represent how we think about climate and how we think about conflict into a much more integrated way. Um, so thank you very much for that. Sonika, I'm going to move swiftly on to you, if I may because you're coming from another part of the world that is navigating the realities of climate change in a very real way in Asia and specifically in Nepal. Uh, you've, you've been young champions of the earth uh, from a UNEP award in 2019, and uh, you're also a, a National Geographic Society emerging explorer. And I know that in particular, you're focusing on data and how data can help us respond to and adapt to climate change. So, help us think through gender responsive data and technology how can that inform uh, gender policy and cl gendered climate policy and action and what are the lessons you're uh, taking from your experience in nepal thank you renata and and um Hello, everyone from Nepal. Um, let me uh, before answering to that question, let me take uh, take you to the bit of a background of um, you know, uh, the situation here and where we have come from. Uh, so let me tell you a brief story about um, Kathmandu. Uh, so Kathmandu uh, was once a green city pioneer with over 700 electric sofa temples, uh, which, has, which are basically three wheelers in Kathmandu. Um, they were all launched in 1995 and these are servicing the city for 25 years and all driven by women micro entrepreneurs. So these uh, electric mini is really reduced um, an estimated 8,000 tons of carbon emission per year compared to diesel buses, and also largely contributes to us uh, reducing air pollution in Kathmandu. But today, uh, fast forward to today, the same city to, uh, suffers from air pollution that's five times higher than the safe level and uh, really kills almost 42,000 people every year in Nepal. And this, this electric transportation sector is uh, basically very, very well suited for Nepal because of its immense hydropower potential. But unfortunately, the same country um, uh, spent around $1.85 billion to import fuel in the fiscal year 2019 and mostly used for transportation, right? And, um, you know, I was five years old when this uh, industry really started and I've grown six times older now, but it is very sad to see that this electric vehicle sector haven't really grown. I mean, from 700, it's even less now. And we see a lot of these electric minibuses rusting in garages. And um, just to remind you, these are the same minibuses I talked about earlier that reduced carbon emission equivalent by 8,000 tons per year. 
And you know, uh, now imagine if it even grew by three times how much carbon emission it could it it would help reduce, right? All of these. Um, um, all of this data of 25 years of women micro entrepreneurs working in this industry and all of this data of carbon emission being reduced and all the data of air pollution being solved, these are not, not really traced any, anywhere. And, and what kind of funding go, goes into this sector and they've never been uh, tracked. So in the, in the curious journey to find out why this happened and when, why the sector never really grew, uh, we, uh, one day I, I met a woman um, when I was taking a photo of a very, very old uh, minibus and her name is Sachita and she's one of the remaining electric minibus drivers. And she was telling me that they use a battery that costs around 4,500 US dollars and that only lasts one year. And a better battery costs double that, but it lasts seven years, right? but no formal financial institutions really trust her for larger loans. Um, you know, she doesn't have any credit history and uh, due to cultural and social norms, asset ownership is not very common here for women, which means she doesn't have collateral uh, for bank to trust her. Now, this is only one story I'm talking about now, multiply this by 700, just, just trying, to, uh, trying to make you understand why this sector never grew, right? Uh, the, the linkage between the women and this electric transportation sector and climate change. Now, it, this really makes it quite evident that women face unique barriers compared to men you know, for example, this conventional financial system is really not working for women, leading to women in electric vehicle sector here in Nepal not being able to scale their business. And that really leading to the slow death of these once beautiful women-led climate-friendly electric minibuses. We saw that there is a need uh, to, to design a solution with a gender intentional approach, keeping women at the center of the design and you know, not adapting for them after building it um, uh, in a gender agnostic way, right? So we are particularly focused on solving this credit gap problem for women micro entrepreneurs. And uh, we found that one of the main problem was lack of interest between uh, the funders and, and the ones who are looking for funding because of concerns about misuse of, uh, misuse of this fund, which is really keeping them from accessing this affordable financing and growing their business. And, um, you know, we thought, oh, we can help uh, to bridge this gap by building trust using technology for automatic fund tracking, basically. So uh, Alloy, my, my startup here in Nepal, what we do is we, we help the impact sector invest in the grassroots women micro enterprises through our digital token platform that can really trace money as well as impact in real time uh, at low cost at, and at any scale of financing, right? So we have enabled until now, we have, we, we have been working with a lot of women micro entrepreneurs and you know, to access affordable financing, to expand their businesses and, and you know, continue being the climate ninjas that they are right now. And um, next year, we really want to reach uh, our 1000 women micro entrepreneur. And we definitely believe that the key to solving three of the global challenges, I mean, such as um, uh, SDG number five, gender equality, SDG number eight, decent work and economic growth, and SDG number 13, climate action, is by mobilizing grassroots green micro-entrepreneurs. And uh, we believe every, with everything we are doing, we want to make sure each dollar or each rupee of investment has a traceable impact so that women micro-entrepreneurs like Sachita globally can grow their business support their families, and at the same time, make regions more resilient to climate change and also at the same time solve air pollution. So that's, that's the gender and um, you know, um, climate change intersection that we, we, we have seen here uh, locally. And uh, yeah, that, I, I hope I answered your question with, uh, with my talk. Uh, and I'll, no. I'd love to answer all the questions. Thank you, Sonika. Thank you. And thanks for bringing such a practical experience. But also, I loved your phrase, gender intentional programming. And I think that's a really interesting and, and, and concrete way to think about these issues. The questions are flowing in, and we're going to move to them uh, immediately. But now, before we do, I wanted to give the last of our panel speakers, last but certainly not least, a chance to 
to really help us think through some of the concrete uh, dimensions of mainstreaming action on gender equality and climate. So Alicia, uh, as the gender envoy uh, in the UK's Foreign Development and Commonwealth Office, you're grappling with these issues every day. And really to you, I would say, as we're seeing momentum build on this agenda, and as we're moving towards COP26, what does meaningful action on gender and climate look like in practice? Thank you very much um, for that, Renata. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. And indeed, as well, thank you to Minister Trevelyan and my fellow panelists for setting out such excellent and inspiring examples of what it means in practice to advance gender equality within climate action. Advancing the rights of women and girls has long been at the heart of my career, including the sort of 22 years that I've spent at DFID and now FCGO. And as you said, Renata, I've recently been appointed as the Gender Envoy, and I'm also the Director for Education at Gender and Equality at the FCGO. And in, in that capacity, I'll be working to ensure that our climate action, including through the UK's COP26 and G7 presidencies, really does center the needs, the priorities, and leadership of women, girls, and marginalized people. As we work to raise ambition on gender-responsive climate action, we must also be clear what this means and how it, should, how it should be done and how to do it. It's not enough to say it's important and leave others to consider the detail. So today I'll focus on our practical work with partners in three priority areas disaster preparedness, food and agriculture systems, and finance. First, our COP26 adaptation and resilience campaign aims to make women, girls, and marginalized people safer from disasters by addressing the disproportionate risks that they face. Through COP26 and the UK's wider international work, we are calling for action to address the impact that gender and other inequalities have on climate risk, scale up gender and shock responsive social protection, prevent gender-based violence, and support access to life-saving sexual and reproductive health and rights in crises. An example of this is our work with partners across the humanitarian and climate communities to champion an inclusive approach to disaster risk reduction through the Risk-Informed Early Action Partnership, or REAP. I'm pleased that the INSU Resilience Center of Excellence under the INSU Resilience Global Partnership, who we work with closely, will support knowledge sharing and best practice to deliver these objectives within climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions. Second, we must address the greater risk that women and girls face of food security and their lack of access to and control over natural resources agricultural te technology and fertile land. We are investing in research and innovation to meet these needs, including responding to the specific demands of women small-scale producers through our work with the CGIAR, as well as identifying best practice to protect the land and resource rights of pastoralists in a gender equitable way through one of our programs, the SPARC program. We will use our COP26 presidency to bring the evidence and the learning being generated through these various initiatives to the international stage. The Just Rural Transition under the COP26 Nature campaign brings together key actors, including women's and indigenous people's organizations to drive the transition towards sustainable and climate resilient land use and agriculture. Third, Action on finance is needed to meet our ambition on gender and climate at the COP26 and beyond. We must not only increase the overall quantity of climate finance, we also need to make finance for both adaptation and mitigation more accessible, impactful, efficient, and crucially gender responsive. This also means ensuring that finance reaches those delivering action on the ground, including women, girls, and the organizations that they lead. The UK has committed to the International Finance Facility, or the ICF, sorry, International Climate Finance, over the next five years. In our recently published priorities for public climate finance, we publicly stated our commitment to improving the gender responsiveness of climate finance. We know that to better reach women and girls and meet their needs, 
we need better data. So this includes working towards a disaggregation of all people-related data by gender, age, disability, and geography within our ICF programming, where this can be meaningfully collected. We will use a drumbeat to COP26 to call on public and private actors to strengthen their commitment on gender equality and climate finance while showcasing best practice. This includes co-hosting an event with the Maldives on this very topic at CSW later this month, chaired by Minister Trevelyan, and I hope as many of you as possible will be able to attend. We must be clear about what gender responsive finance means in practice. And so I'm delighted to give an example here with respect to the CDC, the UK's development finance institution, alongside the DEG and the European Investment Bank have launched the 2X Gender and Climate Investment Task Force, developing tools that will enable investors to put gender at the heart of climate finance flows, including in key sectors such as energy, agriculture, water and hygiene. I firmly believe that to deliver lasting change on both gender equality and climate change, we must tackle the two hand in hand. I hope to work with you, colleagues who are on this call, you know, my fellow panelists, and to learn from you as we seek to deliver on this ambition through real world action in a run up to COP26 and beyond. Thank you, Renata. Thank you very much, Alicia. And we have had fabulous questions coming in uh, over the course of, of the remarks of the panelists. So I'm going to go straight into them and I'm going to be trying to take uh, discussions. Uh, if you have specific questions, do put them in the chat box and we'll try to reach out as many as we can. But Alicia, I'm going to stay with you if I may, because we had 32 um, votes for one question that was raised by Megan Rowling to you, which was really, um, what are the specific actions that the UK is going to be taking in uh, the COP26 to boost women's inclusion in delegations to COP and to amplify their voices and participation at the conference? So maybe I'll uh, ask you, Alicia, to offer some responses to that question. Uh, thank you very much, Fenata. I will, I will certainly try, and I suspect that's coming from as well, um, about, you know, maybe the very composition of, of what, um, you know, the leadership of, of our COP26 efforts uh, look like um, so far. Uh, and just to just to say that, um, for example, the Prime Minister has, has uh, appointed uh, Minister Trevelyan, um, who was uh, on, on the call as a COP26 Adaptation and Resilience Champion. 45% um, of the senior management team of the COP26 unit um, are women. The UK's delegation to the UNFCCC negotiations in recent years um, has consistently been recognised for having more women than men, and I think we'll continue in that trend. Uh, and we've been taking steps to facilitate the full, equal and meaningful participation of women in all levels of action, of climate action, including by engaging closely with civil society organisations. And through the UK-funded Climate Action Support Alliance, or CASA, we are supporting the Women's Negotiator Mentoring Initiative to level the playing field between men and women in the international climate negotiations. So I think at the very way in which we are structured, uh, you know, all the way through to our work with civil society organisations on the ground and to get those voices through, um, you know, we are making efforts with, in that respect. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia, and we'll circle back on, on some other things, but thank you for that, uh, that really uh, prompt response. I'm going to move to you, Zohra, now, because uh, Zohra, there was a question that came up from Peter Verbrugge that uh, a lot of people were interested in, uh, Peter, the political counselor at the Belgian embassy, and it was that you mentioned that some of the big climate funds uh, were not so gender aware. And he was keen to know, could you tell us a little bit about this? Because this would be useful uh, for governments and for people that support them and advise them to, to have some of these arguments uh, and to understand a little bit. What is the lack of gender awareness? Sure. So first it's important, uh, thanks for the question. It's important to note that actually, um, it's not that they're not gender aware. So the fact that they do have gender policies and a gender action plan and even require that proposals that are submitted to them say something on gender, that's already a huge step. That was a big win uh, to have it be kind of central 
to part of it. And there was a point where the Green Climate Fund, for example, stipulated that all proposals that came in had to say something about gender. That was a, that was a big deal. What was happening in the beginning, though, was that proposals were getting approved without having that. There wasn't a lot of scrutiny around it because people didn't quite know what it meant. What, what does it mean to include gender? What does gender responsive mean in those kinds of contexts? What should they be doing? So there was a, a lack of implementation of practice. So I wouldn't say they're not gender aware. They understand the importance, the why. Uh, there was an issue around the how and the what, um, the actual implementation of good policy. I would say that we're still seeing that. And in particular, what we're seeing is that finance isn't reaching women's rights organizations, for example. It's not reaching some of the key architects um, of the measures that we know make a difference at community level. The kind of actors that are being reached by this large scale financing are organizations that can handle large scale financing because that's the way the, the system is set up. It's set up to uh, to be large scale and to organize finance in a particular way, instead of looking at, okay, what kinds of proposals, what kinds of projects would make a difference in different situations and how do we get the finance to those? So um, it's not as simple as, you know, it's, it's not ha happening at all around paying attention to gender, but it's very much at the implementation level now that we need to be looking at who's actually getting finance for what kinds of projects. And that's where we're seeing a gap. These aren't necessarily projects that are helping women, that are transforming gender power dynamics, for example. Sometimes they're reinforcing them and so on. Does that help? Thanks. Thanks, Zora. Uh, Anna, you had your hand up there. Did you want to come in on this particular point? I, on this particular point, but in more general, I do think there is a numbers game that we need to make sure that we are targeting and striving to. And I, I've seen it in other areas, for example, women's voices in the media, where the Gates Foundation published some uh, research back in November, which showed that for every female voice that made it into the media, they were drowned out by at least six men. And the work that I've done with the 30% club in terms of getting more senior women into leadership roles, actually having targets and counting the results drives difference. And I think this is something that we can accelerate. So the policies may be very good in finance, but are we actually making sure that we're delivering to the right numbers of women or women-led projects that deserve, uh, deserve financing? Thank you. Thanks, Emma. And while I have you, I'm going to uh, direct a question at you that has uh, received a lot of interest and support, which is really, you referred to uh, stimulus measures. Uh, and the question from Alice Chilcott is, could you tell us why stimulus measures in the context of the 2008 uh, economic crisis why those stimulus measures for gender equal recovery didn't work and what do we need now do we need something different again i think it is about targeting where you want the money to flow and i think it's very similar whether we're talking about gender or indeed climate change that we have a real opportunity as we around the world see stimulus packages being launched, that they are targeted both at uh, the climate change issue, nature's recovery, and women's role in all of this. And uh, again, I just think uh, in 2008, we just didn't see whether it was gender or indeed climate related or green issues, the, the purpose investment, a purposeful investment that we now know that we need to, to make sure happens so that we deliver change in this vital decade uh, where we need to make sure all of this comes together. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And I'm going now to turn to um, Chatham House's Common Futures platform. The Common Futures is a, a flagship initiative of Chatham House that brings together young people from Africa and Europe to engage in policy debates and to, to share their experiences, to dialogue, but also to have engagement with high level policymakers. So they're a great group of people and I'd love to bring in Olalekan Ojumu 
from Nigeria. Uh, Olalakan, do you want to join us? And I think you have a question for Verania. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you for, for being here. And also, happy, happy Women's Day to you all. All right, my question is this. Um, what steps are taken to ensure that countries, particularly developing countries, they adopt the gender, the gender action plans that ensures gender sensitive response to climate change? Countries, country, um, developing countries, most especially from Africa, from Southeast Asia, from Latin America, South America. That that um, what steps what steps are taken to to make sure these countries adhere strictly to gender action plans that ensures gender sensitivity, gender gender sensitivity responses to climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alalekan. Verania, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, what I was mentioning before, what we have been working with our national partners is to look at not only like isolated, for instance, uh, uh, gender and climate change plans, but actually bring the planning process into this interconnected uh, approach. So where we look at the governance aspects, so which are the institutions that they need to be there uh, to support? What are the capacities, for instance, that are needed to respond to and to implement these plans? The other aspect is about, for instance, the planning process. What is the information that uh, countries need to have at hand in order to inform these uh, uh, planning uh, tools? And for that matter, gender analysis, particularly looking at the specific sectors that they have prioritized are relevant, as well as to clearly allocate resources for the implementation, because what we have seen is that there are, you know, uh, uh, these efforts um, in terms of designing the plans, but not necessarily the plans, you know, get to a point where they are implemented. And then we need to look at the policy frameworks. How can these plans be integrated into the core uh, policy process? So the plans are actually responding to the main commitments and therefore they get funding to be implemented for. So uh, this is kind of the, the approach that uh, uh, countries are starting to look at in a more comprehensive uh, uh, manner and kind of giving also coherence to, the, to their policy and, and, and planning uh, frameworks. So I, I don't know if I have responded. I hope, I hope that's it. But this is kind of like the way that uh, uh, we are working with, with our partners and how is that they've been finding these um, different uh, areas and angles of work. Thanks, Verania, and also noting the points that many of the panel made earlier, the need for local and quite specific solutions, even as we learn across uh, our experiences and, and best practices. Uh, I'm going to bring in now another member of our Common Futures team, Lorna, Lorna Cosgrove from the, from the UK. Lorna, floor is yours. Thank you very much, everyone, for that lovely talk and happy International Women's Day. Um, so my question is about um, climate action its relation to gender. So advocacy for gender justice predates climate action. Would you say that climate action was inspired by gender justice campaigning and action? And what lessons could each movement learn from the other? Great question. I'm going to start with Adenike, uh, if you want to take that question, and then maybe if anyone else wants to chip in. Adenike. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, including women in gender aspect, um, I've been able to increase economic gain because such um, energy that should have been used to um, assess drinking water from a long distance, like more than 20 kilometers, can also be used to channel towards economy um, 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 acquisition because we have different kind of empowerment scheme empowering the informal sectors empowering the formal sectors and the informal sectors are those that um, engage in all of this um, and trade 
and in other um, marketing experts to see that we meet up to our expectations. So all of these things have been seen over the years to have increased women's participation and more importantly in the aspect of climate activism. We could see that what more women are stepping up to power the movement and we could see more progress being achieved because our voice are stronger together as we lead the movement together we could see that the um, the movement is getting more and getting expanded every day and that is the aspect that is what we stand to gain when we could include more women in leadership position we could see them to step into power to deal with issues decisively and to see that the full story of women gets um, a larger part of the decision making and that is why we are advocating for women at different level of governance that if we must solve this issue together then we have to have them in the governance system in, in 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 every part to see that we are all working together on the same platform on the same level to see how we can solve it because we can't close one gap leaving the rest because it can lead to a bigger issue so we have to close it the same time at the same end at both ends thank you Thanks so much, uh, Danike. Uh, Sonika, I'm just going to turn to you for one of the questions about how can we think about the links across gender, environmental justice and climate actions in order to also tackle biodiversity? Because we can't focus, uh, according to Ella Burdett, only on carbon and the race to zero. We have to also think about biodiversity as part of the world's natural resilience and adaptation to climate shocks. Is that something that's on the agenda and in the dialogue and the debate in Nepal right now? I think in terms of uh, biodiversity um, and, and uh, climate and environmental justice, I think definitely there are a lot of uh, advocacy efforts that's going on to save you know the forest for example and and even uh when we talk about biodiversity it's not just about you know uh biodiversity above the soil right we also have to think about um how to make sure we invest in climate smart agriculture so that that's also one of the one of the sector we work with i mean the women micro entrepreneurs in agriculture and the electric vehicle sector right the both the sector we are working with them so i think in nepal where we have seen uh, the men of the house really migrating to abroad for work women are usually the one handling the farms which means if they are not equipped with tools, resources, and knowledge to make sure that they are farming with climate smart te technologies, then I think that part we might lose, right? That we really cannot afford. So we saw that that's really, really important for women to know how to do climate smart agriculture. So that's that's where another, in, another kind of, another chunk of climate impact financing need to go. And it's again, I'm talking about the grassroots women right so you, you know whenever we talk about these um actions uh what i really don't like is we always talk from the very very up above and we basically uh forget the local grassroots innovation and the local people who are actually on on the ground doing something. For example, this electric vehicle is one of the example and another are the farmers who are doing the agriculture but not in commercial way, but they are in a small field, but then if we can equip them, you know, thousands of them with this climate smart agricultural tools, then that can really make the difference. And, uh, you know, I always say this, the collective grassroots action is, is the key, you know? So yeah, that's, that's my answer. Thank you, Sonica. And really what I think is really coming through in both uh, your points across the panel and very much in the questions is the empowering of local communities to develop local solutions. So I'll ask you to sort of maybe think about that. And if anyone wants to come in on that uh, particular dimension, which has been echoed in so many of your examples. But Alicia, I'm going to return to you to, to ask a question that, that has had a lot of uh, votes from Charles Johnston, which is, you've set out ambitious aims for this government in COP26 and on the gender equality and climate action agenda. 
how does that square with the decision to reduce overseas aid funding and how can we square the circle of, of uh, restraint in, in financing at this critical moment? Uh, thank you very much, um, Renata, and uh, thank you very much um, for you know the participant who raised the question. Indeed, um, for all the votes um, for it, um, yes, um, you know a decision has been taken to uh, reduce uh, the amount that we spend on aid from zero point seven to zero point five. Um, you know, with a promise to return um, to zero point seven when the fiscal situation allows. Uh, what I would say is the following with respect to uh, gender equality and uh, our work on climate. We are bound by the Gender Equality Act and by our public sector equality duty. Those are enshrined in law and that's in, you know, we, we, are, we are bound by that. We will we can continue to be committed to that. Um, we are pushing. I will say that we continue to be uh, focused on uh, gender equality, we continue to be focused on climate. They are big priorities for the Foreign Secretary and indeed uh, in taking this work forward, not only in the next financial year, but indeed um, beyond. Uh, within that, I think uh, there are a number of areas. One, um, I think we all recognise a big push from the UK government and from FCG on girls' education. Minister Trevelyan earlier on uh, talked about the relationship between girls' education and uh, climate. We are um, co-leading on an action coalition on gender-based violence. Again, we all spoke about um, that connection between the two. Um, and then we've got big moments this year, as I mentioned earlier on. We've got the G7 uh, and then we've got COP as well. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the benefits of coming together of the merger between uh, legacy DFID and legacy FCU is that what we now have are a number of tools in our box, as it were, a number of tools in our arsenal. Not only do we have development financing and funding, but also the way in which we're able to use our diplomatic efforts across the world of a wide number of countries in order to take forward um, you know, these agendas. So it's a combination of the two moving forward in terms, in a way that we put, it wasn't as strong in the past. Um, of course, we've always worked together hand in hand between development and diplomacy, but by the, by the department coming together, um, you know, we can do so in an even uh, stronger way. So um, what I can't do today, and I don't think what anyone would expect me to do, is to talk about um, particular programs and about um, you know, what is now an internal process with respect um, to spend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elisa. And I appreciate you, uh, you, you taking on that question um, because uh, it's obviously uh, in, still in flux and very much in development. I want to raise a question uh, to all of the panelists and whoever would like to, to raise it from Tess McLeod. And it's about reproductive, women's reproductive health needs. And obviously this has been such an integral part of the agenda on gender equality and women's uh, development and uh, education issues. So in the context of, of climate and in the context of climate action, where does reproductive health needs fit into um, our attempts to, to develop and progress on climate action? Uh, Zora, I don't know if you want to kick us off on that or if any other of the panelists uh, uh, would like to speak to that question. Sure, I can try. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I understand it's kind of making the point that reproductive rights and reproductive health and rights and sexual health and rights as well are important and necessary to consider as part of any climate action. And to that, I would just say, yes, I agree. <laughs> it is absolutely so. Um, and I think when you are developing programs that are, of course, about the climate or thinking about different kinds of climate action you can take, if you're starting from the position of paying attention to gender dynamics, then this is an inevitable thing that will come into the programming. It's, it's not really avoidable. It's so central uh, to women being able to exercise autonomy over their lives and also has a huge impact on kind of the, the resources they need and also what their availability is to do to do different things whether they have choice and control um, over their bodies whether they have access to that kind of basic health care um, and that includes uh, you know things like access to abortion during a, a climate disaster and things like this um, because all kinds of things go into flux when systems are disrupted and infrastructure um, is disrupted and often things like maternity health and maternally 
maternal care go out the window um, under the idea that other issues are more urgent or important, like access to food or access to clean drinking water, as if as if there's a hierarchy there when for women there, there just isn't. It's not like you can make those kinds of choices when it's all happening to your body. So um, I would say it's central to, to the work we do in that it's central to women and therefore has a place in, our, in the work that Gaga um, is initiating and part of. Um, and I, yeah, I would, I'd love to hear about how others think about this. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Zora, for, for, for putting the centrality of that question in the broader issue of women's uh, rights and equality. Branya, there was also a question about migration and the impact of climate uh, on migration and how that impacts women. Sonika mentioned it in the context of women taking over uh, key agricultural roles as uh, partners or male in males and households are leaving uh, and for migration. So how can we think about that in the context of climate action and the specific needs of women and girls in, in, in climate-led migration? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is very much related to, you know, the, the, the climate crisis context that we see and, and the aspect of, uh, of climate security that definitely relates to, to the fact that you know, uh, involuntary displacements uh, are, are, are taking place and, and, and will increase definitely if, if uh, the, there are no opportunities uh, for different populations to, to adapt to the impacts of climate change or, or even to um, uh, be part of the, of the solutions to respond to these uh, climate stresses. So um, definitely this is a, a, a it, it, it's, it's kind of like an, an emerging uh, theme, I, I would say, uh, uh, climate uh, uh, security, it's an emerging theme and it's pretty much related to the aspect of, of uh, involuntary uh, migration. Um, there, there, is inter this, uh, there is an interesting uh, study that uh, looks at, at the different uh, triggers and, and the main aspects are you know, the, the, the lack of, for instance, uh, organizational capacity, um, the lack of uh, access to rights, you know, to basic uh, a assets, for instance, and, and also the, the, the aspects that they need, I mean, they relate to the decision-making process, right? Like how can, you know, uh, these populations and particularly women the, uh, and women groups within these populations can, um, have a, a, a voice uh, in, in terms of the of the decision making uh, process. So yeah, I think I would I would say that that is definitely an, an area that it's it's is taking more uh, interest in 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 look. I mean in in the policy uh, level, like you know there are uh, for instance Kenya is one of the countries that have incorporated uh, uh, climate security as one of the aspects in their NDCs. So it's it's I mean we're seeing countries being more uh, attentive to this aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Verania. Emma, we have time for one more question. I'm going to turn to you because it was a popular question, which is back. Sorry, you're muted. You're, you're muted. Right? Sorry, excuse me. That I'm going to turn to you for the question, Emma, that was a popular one, which is really about the local empowerment and the local community empowerment. And the question is, how can that be done in the UK uh, in terms of climate action and climate response? Of what are the options to further devolve decision-making to local communities? Well, I think around the country, there are all manner of different ways to get involved in responding to the climate and the emergency and nature's recovery. And I see uh, the adaptation agenda, the mitigation agenda, and the nature's recovery agenda coming very closely together. And I, I think it is a matter for stepping forward. When I think of the number of people involved in responding to flooding, for example, which is what the something that the Environment Agency leads on in England, often after a flooding event, 
members of the community step forward to get more involved. And that is a combination of both men and women taking a role there to become flood wardens, local champions, understanding some of the things that can be done at a local um, level. And I think when we discuss vulnerable countries, we also need to look at vulnerable communities in developed countries and work out the best mechanisms to involve women and help them to be part of those debates. And it, there, there are just lots of different ways that people can become involved in that local action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. We do have time for one more question. And I, and I think it's one that I'm going to, to flag that came up from, I think an interesting comment uh, from Maria Golda Hilario. And it's really in response to climate financing and why it's not flowing into women's groups, uh, Zora, that you pointed out, perhaps some of the slowness and Sonica you pointed out. And um, she points out that is it because for so long we've seen the climate agenda and the gender agenda as separate and that even she refers to the UNFCCC reports, there, there are references to gender equality, there's references to the gender dimension, but they're not really fully integrated as organic interconnected human systems issues. So do you think we are now, finally, as we look to COP26, moving beyond treating gender issues as a separate chapter. And I think that came through in the questions to you, Adenika, and how we understand conflict and separate issues. Or is it still a little bit of an afterthought uh, question for us? I'm going to ask all the panel if you'd like to flag any, any final thoughts here. Are, are we beyond uh, are we truly integrated? And is there any one thing you'd like to see coming out of COP26 to help us advance that integration better? I'm going to start maybe with Sonica. Any one thing you would like to see coming out of COP26? I think I'd love to see, um, also because of COVID, we've seen that the entire world, uh, you know, need to go digital. But then um, I always ask myself this question, what percentage of the world is actually ready to go digital, right? And, you know, especially women and especially the grassroots, they are not really ready. So I think they need to be included and there needs to be tools and resources available for them, designed for them. Um, again, the gender and intentional approach and, and for the grassroots, right? To really uh, lift the grassroots economy, the grassroots local innovations. I think uh, we need to equip them with uh, tools and resources. So I really love to see that coming out of COP26 and um, you know, include uh, them in this digital revolution. Thanks, Sonica. A digital revolution for COP26 to help advance women uh, participation and perspective. Adenika, what would you like to see coming out of COP26? If you could pick one thing. Okay, thank you so much. I would like to see that um, more women are empowered because we have very little percentage of women being um, finance being channeled towards um, empowerment scheme for women because these are women that are doing extraordinary things. We have seen them to be an entrepreneur, trying to convert ways to renewable things that we can use like bags, shoes, and everything that is needed for us to make our world sustainable. So empowerment is a key word in all of these issues that we are talking about. We have social empowerment, education is another form of empowerment, you know, um, economic empowerment in terms of having access to finance for them to be able to expand their means. And also participation of women in the negotiation process, because we know that in COP26, these are where big decisions are being made. And women have to be in that room, the same room that the men are there to make this decision, to stand for women, to stand for um, our rights across the globe, to see that decisions that are made here, it binds around all the women and it's going to be something that is going to help us to um, 
reach our gender equality because these are um, issues that is making us to take back stage and for us Thank to be able you, to... Thank you, Jenica. So we're going to say we want women in COP26 and at the negotiating table. Verania, very quickly. Um, yes, very, very quickly. I, I mean, just to say that um, I, I would like to see like far more like policy coherence and articulation. So between, you know, gender considerations and dimensions, looking at these building blocks, but we cannot, you know, stay there. We need to take advantage of the cycle a process that the NDCs are giving us as an opportunity and also to see a much more a linkage uh, you know of, to, of the NDCs and the climate action to the recovery process kind of lay out a clear path to ensure a green recovery linked to NDCs to climate commitments I would really hope to see that thank you thanks for Anya so going beyond uh yeah. COP and climate action to a much broader recovery Zora your thoughts yeah, I would, I would say two things. One is uh, you asked kind of is gender here or are we still fighting to include gender? I'd say gender is here, but it's the how. It's the implementation that we have a gap. Um, and there's two things around that that need to happen. One is that any proposals should include uh, a requirement for them to be gender just. If the, if the proposition is not gender just, throw it out. So anything that's coming up for any idea, ask just ask the question. And then in terms of the how, instead of you know, trying to do what you were going to do and adding women or adding gender, try to do something that actually serves women and gender first. Um, so it's a little bit, you know, stop with the square peg round hole thing. Um, and actually, what would it look differently like if we were actually starting from the premise that we're going for, for gender just climate solutions? Thank you so much. Emma, next to last word to you before I give it to Alicia. Well, I've spent a lot of the last decade focusing on the adaptation and resilience agenda, which is often seen as the poor cousin, the Cinderella of the climate change movement. And as much as I spend time making sure that when we're talking about the race to zero, we're also talking about the race to resilience, shining a spotlight on the adaptation agenda and the race to trillions of dollars that we know are needed in order to get us on track for climate change, um, but also nature's recovery. We need to make sure that women feel very much part of all of those discussions. And we all owe it to the world to shine a spotlight and bring women into those discussions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emma. Alicia, you're, you're going to be preparing for this for the head. What did you take and what's your wish list? Yes, thank you very much for that. I and mean, you know what I mean? It's probably probably very difficult to come on the back of, of what I've already heard. You know, people talking about um, you know, meaningful participation of women at all levels, talking about the way in which we get finance to work. I think the very premise of the discussion this afternoon is that we, we're getting there in terms of gender and, and, and climate action, but we're not actually there yet. You know, we want to see a lot more action and, and this being rooted um, in, in, in the real world a lot more. So I think that my what I would put on the table is that we come out of it. Um, with a clearer sense of how we're going to do that moving forward, building on all of the incredible work that's been done at the grassroots and at other levels. Um, and it's, you know, we just, we just getting us over the line and, and propelling us for the next, um, for the next stage of this is where, is what I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to everyone. I have a ton of questions that we haven't been able to get to. So it's uh, a sign of the interest in this topic, sign of the hope. And I really wanted to thank our panelists for being practical, for being inspiring, for showing that it's not just uh, that women are disproportionately impacted by climate, but women are also part of the solution to climate challenges. Uh, you talked about the need for representation, you need talked about financing, you talked about local solutions, and you talked about how some of the really interesting and innovative ways that women can play a part in tackling climate uh, challenges that we face. So thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for giving us practical ideas. I very much hope that you'll take those with you into COP26 and beyond. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, thank you to the audience and my appreciation to uh, the COP26 presidency for continued collaboration in this agenda. Uh, everybody, good night and happy Women's Day. Thank you. Good night. Thank Bye. you very much. Cheers. Good night. Thank you.